Well, good afternoon and thank all of you for joining us today for this important panel discussion. I am Governor John Bell Edwards from Louisiana uh, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, with Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham of New Mexico, Lieutenant Governor Laney Kunalakis from California, but also Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. And today we're going to be talking about the work that we're doing at the state level to support and accelerate much of the President's climate agenda, including investing in climate resilience in every community across the country, how we're working to deepen our commitment to shared uh, goals like collaborating as states with the federal government uh, in the face of the climate crisis. And I, I have every reason to believe this will be a fascinating discussion because I was able to participate in a panel yesterday uh, with two of these uh, same panelists and I think you're going to be excited and pleased to hear uh, from them. Um, and then also this is the second day in a row we've been joined by top level officials with respect to the climate uh, from the Biden administration. Yesterday was Gina McCarthy, uh, domestic climate policy advisor, and today it's special presidential envoy John Kerry. Um, and I want to be very clear at the outset, leadership matters. Um, you know, I suspect I'm the first governor of Louisiana, of my state, to speak out clearly and repeatedly about climate change. Um, but I'm also certain I won't be the last. And the Biden administration, as you know, is placing a focus on the climate crisis and re recommitting our country to the Paris Accords. Uh, that leadership is important not only for our country, but for the entire world. Uh, and governors have been leading even when the federal government did not. And this is important. I mean, just think about it. Uh, President Obama committed the country to the Paris Accords. Uh, President Trump withdrew from that. President Biden's recommitted the country. But in the meantime, you had 24 states led by governors that stayed committed to the Paris Accords. And that's how we have some stability in our policies and create real momentum. Uh, and if you've ever heard me speak about it, Louisiana in many ways is ground zero in the country when it comes to climate change. Uh, we, we've had five major hurricanes strike our state just in the last 14 months. Uh, we've also had a freak winter storm. We've had flash flooding. All of this, as you know, carried out uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but we have had other uh, challenges as well. And one of the things we did actually about three years ago is I created a chief resilience officer, uh, Charles Sutcliffe, who's with us today. Uh, and the, the goal there uh, was for him at the state level, but working with a cabinet official uh, from every agency in the state who's also the resilience officer for that agency in order to look at our vulnerabilities and to de develop strategies uh, to make sure that we can work across all of our agencies to promote and create more resilient communities. This is very much in line with what President Biden has been talking about. Uh, also, a couple of years ago, I created the Climate Initiatives Task Force to address one of our biggest goals, uh, and I suspect it's one that everyone in this uh, building uh, shares, and that is getting to net zero by 2050. That is a tall state, uh, I'm sorry, that is a tall task for any state, but a state like Louisiana, I suspect it's especially tough because we're a traditional oil and gas state, uh, and the production, uh, the refining, the chemical manufacturing, all of that remains uh, very important for our economy. But we're seeing the effects of climate change, as I mentioned, like no other uh, state. So we are committed, and we've just not paying at lip service. We've committed billions of dollars to restoring Louisiana's coastline to help build back our natural coastal barrier. We actually have a science-driven 50-year, $50 billion coastal master plan, uh, and we are on track. We're investing currently a billion dollars a year to support 10,000 jobs, and we have a record number of projects completed, but also others in design and in construction. And what I can tell you is that when the, these projects are brought to bear, Louisiana for the first time in decades will be creating more land than it is losing. Uh, that is very important because we have lost 2,000 square miles of land in the last 80 years. Every bit of this is coastal marsh. And every acre of coastal marsh can sequester as much carbon as, I'm sorry, 80 times as much carbon as an acre of forest land. So this is incredibly important for all of those reasons. Uh, and and I, again, I think this too 
dovetails exactly with what President Biden's vision is when it comes to being more resilient and adapting uh, to climate change. We're also looking to mitigate risk while we make, uh, make where we live safer, address the long-term challenges that climate change poses to our state, but also to our economy. And, and my vision for Louisiana is to remain a very prominent leader in energy. And that means we have to embrace the transition. It's gonna happen, the world market has changed. And so we have to make sure that we change along with it. Uh, and that, that's the renewables, that's wind, that's solar, that's carbon capture and sequestration, that's biomass, that's hydrogen. And by the way, we're moving forward on all of these areas. That's why I'm excited to be in Glasgow this week. Um, and, and I'm also excited, as I mentioned earlier, to be joined by these other uh, panelists. And it is my honor to welcome uh, to the podium, unless she decides to stay in her seat, which I gave her the option, um, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of California. Uh, Eleni Kunalakis is with us today. Uh, and, and again, I, I can tell you from her presentation yesterday, she is extremely proud, as she should be, of the work that California has done in this space and the leadership role uh, that it has assumed for our country. Uh, and so I wanna now invite uh, the Lieutenant Governor to come up and make her opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Governor Edwards. It's a great honor uh, to be here and to share a few words and a few thoughts about the importance of subnational leadership uh, within the construct of uh, COP26 and the Paris Climate Accords. Um, so first and foremost, I think um, having Secretary Kerry uh, the Special Envoy for Climate here, President Biden, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, who was here, Gina McCarthy, this very strong showing of the United States and the we are all in uh, message that the United States is sending is critically important to us in California. Um, this is our number one foreign policy issue in our state and uh, uh, U.S. leadership is critical to that. But on the subnational, um, uh, the, the topic of subnational leadership, I think it's important to recognize that within Paris, uh, it was always understood that whereas uh, federal governments, sovereign governments would make the commitments, it would be up to uh, regions, cities, states, uh, subnational entities to be able to actually mobilize to meet the, uh, the goals that were set. And in California, uh, we've been working on this for a very long time. And it all stems um, from probably the most important uh, uh, lever that we have, which uh, was um, started in the 1970s with the establishment of the Clean Air Act, which gave California the authority to set our own emission standards. And I talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday, um, but it's really been um, key to California's leadership on this issue. So back in 2002, California established the country's very first uh, emissions limits and emission standards, the CAFE standards. And when President Obama was elected, one of the very first things he did was took the CARB standards, took California's CAFE standards, and made them the standards for the entire country. And by the way, Mary Nichols is here. She is an icon of uh, leadership for our state, and it's great to see her here uh, at, uh, at COP26. Um, so I'd like to just mention a couple of other ways that California can lead from uh, and is leading from the subnational platform that we have. Um, during uh, the last administration, as the federal government sought to take the United States out of the Paris Accords, California, along with 23 other states representing more than half of the population of the country and more than half of the economy of the GDP of the United States stayed in Paris. Uh, and uh, that was the U.S. Climate Alliance, which I think over time shows the commitment of the American people, of whom more than 70 percent are supportive of staying in Paris and continuing to fight climate change. Uh, but there are lots of other ways. Over the last few years, we have signed over 60 MOUs with the international community 
and California, specifically around environmental issues. 20 of those have been with China at the local, uh, state, and federal level. Uh, we have sister state relationships with 28 provinces and states around the world. Uh, and every year, for many years now, and certainly Mary Nichols can talk about this as well if you want to pull her aside, thousands, thousands of, uh, of, of experts working for governments around the world have come through California, have visited uh, our experts at the California Air Resources Board uh, have visited with our experts at the Energy Commission to learn California's best practices. We have had a red carpet rolled out to the world to understand how California has been able to tackle the issue of clean air and clean water and uh, clean energy, and we will continue to do that. And then finally, uh, one of our landmark uh, leadership areas is with the Under Two Coalition, California, along with Baden-Württemberg in 2015, under the leadership of Jerry Brown, uh, came up with the concept of the Under Two Coalition. There are now 260 subnational governments representing 1.75 billion people and 50% of the global economy who have signed on to the Under Two Coalition with the leadership of California and Baden-Württemberg. And so let me just uh, conclude uh, by saying that um, Governor Newsom is extremely forward-leaning uh, as we have had bipartisan uh, gubernatorial leadership on the area of climate. Governor Newsom is very forward-leaning and just uh, last year signed an executive order whereby uh, by 2035, all new cars sold in the state of California must be zero emission vehicles. California is the largest consumer market in the United States. And so when, uh, with Governor Newsom's executive order, uh, we have already seen a major changes uh, in the automotive industry to be able to service this market. And we're setting uh, the tone in the country, I hope, in the world, uh, I hope, as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our next speaker, uh, my friend uh, and colleague uh, from uh, the great uh, state of, um, of uh, sorry, New Mexico, uh, Governor Michelle Lujan. We're having this back and forth. She introduced me yesterday as being from Hawaii. So I don't know if it's the jet lag or we just looking for sunnier climes. Um, but Governor Lujan uh, is the first uh, Democratic Latina ever elected in US history. She served representing her state uh, in Congress. Uh, she has made her career around her focus on people with disabilities, seniors, um, public education and our veterans. And she, uh, as governor, uh, recently signed the bill into law uh, whereby New Mexico will have a 100% carbon-free grid by 2045. Governor, please take the podium. I think it's also something about being a bit uh, challenged by our statures. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I really appreciate that. It shows the, I hope, the collegiality and the leadership among the states and all elected leaders who are working effectively and efficiently together to meet not only the U.S. climate action goals, but to make sure that we are identified uh, on our own and collectively as being leaders in climate action around the globe. So it's an incredible honor for me to be part of this panel and it's an incredible honor to join my uh, colleague and good friend, uh, Governor Edwards, and clearly uh, to be participating with a brand new federal administration where uh, climate action is no stranger to the number of priorities that we are clearly going to make good on. And at the end of my remarks, I'm certainly going to have the incredible opportunity to introduce uh, the special envoy. 
Uh, I just wanted to give everyone kind of a quick glimpse also into New Mexico. We're another energy state. And I think most people come to the conclusion that energy states cannot be part of the solution. And in fact, we are the innovators in real time working with not only policymakers but business to do any number of things. So the same issue. Right, when, before I took office, New Mexico was not part of the US Climate Alliance. One of my first executive orders was to do that, is to create an all of government approach to tackling climate. So that means that we do everything in every context, from the companies that we work with and recruit into the state, to everything that we do in procurement and making sure consumers have access to renewable energy. It also led to a landmark piece of legislation called the Energy Transition Act, which set our renewable energy standards, set our uh, uh, carbon standards for utility, uh, utility companies, and led the way for us to provide equity investment so that we are dealing with displaced workers and uh, communities that are often left behind in these transformations or transitions. And if you know uh, a little about New Mexico, you know that we are home to the, uh, the country's largest individual number of sovereign nations in the country. That means that we really have to be paying attention to what can be treated as marginalized communities. It never had to happen. It's untenable, unforgivable, and immoral. And we have an opportunity in these transitions to invest real strategies and real money into the families that need it most and into the communities that we're gonna hold responsible for a for clean energy transformation into a new energy economy. Uh, so where are we after all of that? Where we're going to put into statute now that we're going to be uh, 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 carbon zero by 2050. So again, listening to the other states, making sure that we create a legal foundation so that we don't have the opportunity for anyone to come in, right, and move the needle backwards. It just has to be accelerated forwards. And I think that you're going to hear us all talk about how we're going to get to carbon negative strategies in each of our states and building that collectively for the country. The next thing we're going to do is we intend to be partners with Louisiana in moving towards hydrogen. And we expect to pass a hydrogen act in our upcoming legislature. Uh, and that is a critical way to both decarbonize transportation, to bring in innovation, to make sure that we have stability and moving forward so that we not just meet our climate goals, but frankly, we, we exceed them. And that gives us the opportunity to do that in agriculture, to make sure that we're doing water innovation, to make sure that we are meeting the America Beautiful Plan by doing conservation. New Mexico was one of the first states to join the 30 by 30 plan, you in fact can do and should be doing all of the above as we work together to make sure that we collectively save the planet and create real opportunity uh, and protection for our consumers. So uh, thank you all so very much for having me. And of course, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, introduce the former secretary and the special envoy. Uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to Mr. John Kerry. Michelle, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, John Bell and Eleni, great to be with both of you. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here with terrific public servants who you can tell from the comments they just made are each of them super seized by the climate responsibility. Um, and regardless of uh, the difficulties they face with respect to being oil producers, gas producers, energy producers, uh, they understand the imperative of moving forward. And it's not a surprise. Uh, each of them has served with distinction for other years in one fashion or another, uh, particularly uh, uh, Governor John Bell Edwards was uh, in the House of Representatives in Louisiana. Uh, 
uh, and in the military, I might add, parachuter. Uh, and uh, Eleni, who I knew, who held a, a fundraiser for me when I was running for President of the United States. She had great judgment back then, and she has better judgment now. <laughs> so I'm deeply appreciative. I even remember her house very distinctly outside Sacramento, uh, uh, up on a hill. It was a terrific afternoon, and I'm grateful there. But she served as our ambassador to Hungary uh, for several years under President Obama, which means that I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I'm responsible for having gotten her there, correct? <laughs> That was my payback. Uh, I'm also honored to be here with the famous uh, and incredibly qualified Mary Nichols. Uh, she is the gold standard, uh, really the gold standard for environmental vision and environmental enforcement. Um, and I think all of us are deeply uh, indebted to you for your many years of effort. Thank you. You've helped California changed so many different things, from automobiles to uh, uh, air standards and so forth. And we really thank you. Thank you. Um, the day Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, which I had the privilege of leading our negotiating team on back in 2015 in Paris, um, I was on the phone very quickly with a number of governors. And the next morning, Governor Jay Inslee, uh, Governor Jerry Brown, Governor Andrew Cuomo and I announced the notion that uh, Donald Trump may be pulling out of the agreement, but the American people are going to stay in. And we continued to work. But when I say we, I really mean you. The governors and the mayors. I was with the C40 mayors earlier this morning, and uh, we were talking about sort of the road and where we are. Uh, I think each of the, the two governors and the lieutenant governor who are here would agree with me uh, that mayors are just on the front line in a way that no one else is. And they have a better finger on the pulse and a better capacity to affect things than almost anybody else. I was a lieutenant governor for a period of time, and I don't think I would have become a senator had I not had the very broad support of mayors across the state for the work that we did together. Um, the uh, key point I want to emphasize here is central to why we're here today. Uh, the subnational governing entities of the world are going to be absolutely critical to our ability to be able to get to net zero and to make the next decade what it has to be. And let me emphasize what it has to be. If we do not cut enough between 2020 and 2030, we lose 1.5 degrees. If we don't cut enough, in the next decade, we cannot achieve net zero 2050. So all of the vision and all of the effort of so many countries is dependent on what happens up and down the full political, economic, governance ladder. Now, I will tell you that uh, over the last months, under President Biden's instructions, we have been reaching out to countries all around the world. I was in Mexico for a whole day the other day, met with President Lopez Obrador, who agreed, finally, to not just talk about oil, but to talk about what he's going to do in Mexico to deploy renewables of all kinds, geothermal, wind, solar, and hydro. And that's a shift. I was in Saudi Arabia, where they announced they're going to go for net zero. I was in, I was not, my team was in South Africa, where they succeeded in reaching an agreement on how we're going to phase out coal plants and shift to renewable energy. Indonesia, I worked for months with the minister. He finally announced that they will set a 50% target, which they can achieve if we do the job of helping them to be able to transition to new technology and away from uh, coal. So it's doable. 
And just today, I was shown a chart based on the NDCs that are now submitted to the UN FCCC. And that chart shows that from 2.7 degrees or more where we were headed, if those NDCs are implemented, we will actually be below two degrees. I was stunned when I saw that. That's what the modeling shows. And that's the second day into this COP. That's before we have all the NDCs. And Mexico said they're going to submit a new NDC next year. So we know that even that can go down. So how do we put our best foot forward to guarantee that we're going to get to where we have to go? We have to deploy trillions of dollars. That's going to be there. Today, an announcement's being made on something a lot of us have worked on, where 100 plus trillion dollars are of assets are going to be positioned to be deployed to do the investing necessary to affect this transition. Whether or not it gets deployed is going to depend on whether or not at the local level, in the governing level, in states and regions, people are able to bring business and government together and blend the finance, de-risk the investment, and be able to create the capacity to have bankable deals. That's doable for energy. It's doable for water. It's doable for transportation. And we can get power purchase agreements that go out for 25 and 30 years, and we can make this happen. After this COP, we'll be transitioning my team directly into a hand-holding you know, uh, uh, aid agency that's going to be out there working with each of these countries. I've appointed a experienced uh, uh, former diplomat uh, former ambassador to Indonesia and Sri Lanka, former charge d'affaires in Delhi in India, former assistant secretary of state to Southeast Asia. And he, for Southeast Asian affairs, and he is now on the ground in India. He's going to work with India to help deploy the 450 gigawatts of renewable energy that Prime Minister Modi has committed to. So my, I just want you to feel the energy of what can come out of this next 10 days. And most importantly, what will, I think and hope, come out of your continued efforts? The truth is that even while Donald Trump was president, 75 percent of the new electricity that was created in the United States came from renewables. 90 percent of the new electricity that's been created globally is now coming from renewables. And renewables are competitive in price with other options, but they beat coal 20, I mean, unbelievable, because nobody ever does the real cost of coal, which is black lung disease, heating of the ocean, uh, the air particulates that are raising the acidity of the ocean. I mean, you run the list of cost of coal, and you're beginning to understand why we're where we are today. So my friends, I'm proud to announce today our sub-national leadership initiative for climate, which will be a U.S. government interagency in initiative to catalyze ambitious climate action by cities, states, and regions around the world. That's how we're going to get this done. And we need governor, lieutenant governor, governor, we need you on the front lines of this effort, working subnationally, but working internationally to show other governments how they can do what you're doing. All of these steps you're taking are essential to building the movement that's going to achieve uh, our goal here. I, I have to tell you, folks, I've been at this since Jim Hansen testified in Congress in 1988. I was in Rio at the first conference and in many other of the cops, including Kyoto and Copenhagen and Paris. And I'm telling you, there's a different energy here. There is a different level of commitment. We never had the private sector at the table the way we do now. We never had the sense of urgency being stated by leader after leader. We never had oil producing, gas producing countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, others, Saudi, you know, stepping up and setting ambitious goals and saying they're going to get this done. So this is a moment to uh, not savor. It's a moment to feel comfort that you know when you go out there and start pushing the limits, other people are going to be there with you.
and that is the only way we get where we need to go. So I'm deeply appreciative for the effort. Uh, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for being here and being part of this effort. Look forward to working with you in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, First of all, your enthusiasm for the job. Talking about energy, but it's going to take energy out of you and people like you all over the world to get this done. Um, I know that one of the things that's on everybody's minds deals with equity, and so I've got we've got time, I think, for a question or two. Uh, and I'm I'm going to ask the question in a moment, uh, Mr. Secretary. I'll ask that you lead off with a response, and then we'll go to uh, the Governor of New Mexico and then Lieutenant Governor of California. Um, but we need to ensure a just transition. Uh, for historically marginalized communities, uh, those who are disproportionately affected by both the climate change that we're experiencing, but also uh, by the transition uh, that is underway. And this certainly includes indigenous uh, people. So dealing with the climate crisis, as we all know, has put those communities, those peoples at the forefront. How can we, and what must we do, I guess, to ensure a just transition uh, through uh, the federal and state level in terms of the policies, the approaches that we all take? Well, the single most important thing we could do is pass President Biden's legislation in the United States Congress right now. That's the single most important thing. That has unbelievable commitment to make this a just transition and help people be able to uh, minimize, if not completely avoid, any dislocation or disruption as we transition. Um, it's disingenuous to say to people that some folks aren't going to somehow be affected in this co big a transformation of our economy. But on the, uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, it's doable, it's manageable, providing we plan, providing we don't just wipe our hands of it once things pass and walk away. If, if we are conscientious, and I know you are, and, and I believe... Uh, uh, most folks in public life try to be, we will manage to take people from where they are, help cushion the transition, nobody, you know, being lost to uh, their inability to pay the rent or take care of their health care, and then retrain depending on age and predilection. Nobody's going to be told what they have to do, but if they want to continue or they want to break into these new fields, they're there to be broken into. Last year, Fastest growing job in the United States of America was wind turbine technician. Third fastest growing job was solar panel installer. You're going to wonder, well, what was the second? Nurse practitioner because of COVID. So you get the picture. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has those two disciplines I just talked about. It's the only, only two jobs other than nurse practitioner that will be over 50% growth this year. So. This is the future. This is going to happen. Ford Motor Company, General Motors are committed to the transition of our automobiles. That's why the governor can make a statement that we know 2035, this is what we're going to do. And it helps to make it happen for him to issue that order. But Ford and, 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 and General Motors are going to retool their plants. But people are still going to be needed to build those vehicles. And in record numbers, I believe, as we make a transition of our entire auto fleet. So I see exciting possibilities here to address this shocking level of inequality that has been built into our, our society, into our structure over the last 20, 30 years, Republican and Democrat alike. But we have to deal with that if we want to deal with the anger that is distorting people's response to legitimate public choices. And that's a critical component, I think, of strengthening our democracy and even preserving it. So that's what I think is the most important thing we need to do. Put the plan in place, implement it, deal with people's transition, and open up these new economic, this, this whole new economic world that we're going to be seeing. Uh, well, I uh, can't agree more, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we, in in changing our standards for clean electricity and setting uh, aggressive climate goals, 
we actually set aside millions of dollars to do two things change the dynamics for economic development in the area that was going to be affected most, and the other half, so it's $20 million, goes to the workers themselves. So that as they're engaged in a new energy economy and making choices for themselves, they actually have security in their pocketbooks about making sure their families are fed and there's a roof over their heads. Because without that security, I do think we create an environment where we are uh, uh, pushing false choices. And then at the same time, we are addressing free college in the state of New Mexico. So it's not just about high school students, it's about displaced workers, it's about veterans going back to college, no wrong door, two year, four year certificates. We're investing in centers of excellence that can do that retraining right in the areas that we're doing this energy transformation in the state. And then to deal with the public health issues, we now have the most aggressive methane rule in the country and uh, we are very happy with the federal government's announcement about their methane rules, which has strong accountability and monitoring, but also sets a really incredible standard. Ours is 98% reduction in methane emissions by 2026. So we're dealing with real public health issues. We're reinvesting real dollars into that communi those communities. And then the private sector, as you said, is reinvesting. And then last thing, if you've been doing this work at a power plant, uh, Governor Edwards and I will tell you that our power plants are ready to be hydrogen. Uh, and that's similar work in a similar way with frankly more stability in their careers for their families than in the current environment without all of the public health issues that uh, have uh, uh, plagued this country and so many other countries. Thank you. We're past due, we're past due. I think we'll probably have to wrap it up then, but uh, maybe refer everyone to the panel that we did yesterday where we talked about the importance of dealing with equity, uh, where we uh, uh, talked about some of the challenges we're having, uh, wildfires, drought, uh, this is uh, the existential threat of our time, and subnational governments are going to have to continue to lead the way along with our partnership with our federal government, which is now back all in on climate action. Thank you, everyone. So thanks, everybody, for joining us, and this will obviously conclude this panel. Thank you.